Dr. Peter McGraw is a behavioral economist. He is a business school professor and bachelor who's turning his attention to the opportunities and challenges of single living. His newest book is Solo, Building a Remarkable Life on Your Own. Welcome to the show, Peter. Oh, pleasure to be here. I'm excited to have you on. Tell us a little about your personal life, some more about your work, and what motivated you to put pen to paper and write the book. Well, let's start with that last bit. Um, I This is a new endeavor for me. I'm about five years into the solo project, as I like to call it. It started as a podcast. And I had moved my attention away from the scientific study of humor into something that I think uh, is even more compelling and even more important, which is to how can we help this fast-growing segment of society, singles, live a better life? And I did it in some ways selfishly. That is that uh, the solo project was designed to help a younger version of me. So I wanted to create the resource that I wish I had when I was 25 and starting to figure out that my path might not be that conventional, but not feeling like there was resources for this. There was no one talking about it. Um, and uh, and thus, as a, as a result of that, it's very easy, I think, as a single person to kind of feel less than, feel out of place, and feel like there's only this one way of doing life. And if you choose not to do that way, or if you're having difficult finding that way, uh, you, you're in trouble. There's something wrong with you. And I I you know there's plenty of things wrong with me, uh, but <laughs> but I never I learned that my singleness wasn't one of them. I appreciate that. And how is the the, the project is five years in? The book just came out. How mm -hmm. is it? How is it being received? Do you feel like you have have honored that younger version of yourself? I do. Yeah. I mean, I think that this is this project's a little bit polarizing. You know, and the book's a little bit polarizing. I have a line in the book that my thesis is that married living is not as good and single living is not as bad as people tend to assume. And I have the data. And, you know, that said, uh, the project is not anti-marriage in any way. Uh, I just happen to believe that it's overprescribed. There's almost nothing that humans do at the rate that we were getting married in 1960, right? Mm -hmm. In 1960, 90% of adults married did so on average age of 21. Um, and that number is way, way down now. So half of American adults are single. Half of them are not interested in dating or a relationship at the moment. And Pew Research projects that 40, excuse me, uh, Pew Research or pre Pew Research, sorry about this. That's okay. Um, <laughs> Pew Research projects that 25% of millennials will never marry. Huh. And so these are, this is a huge demographic shift, but in many ways, I believe is kind of more in line with what is right for humanity, right? Like we live in a world where we have artists and engineers, we have blue collar workers and white collar workers. We have people who are meat eaters and people who are vegetarians, uh, people who like to go to the beach and people who like to go to the mountains. And so we have diverse interests, values, lifestyles, and this one size fits all of relationships can't possibly work for everyone. Especially because I know this because marriage was per fairly recently invented and is continually changing, right? So it's not even the case that marriage was necessary for our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Um, it was invented to solve societal problems. And so it, um, it helps some individuals and it doesn't help others. And I think we need a little bit wider discourse about that. I think that everything you said certainly makes sense. I find it to be fascinating. <laughs> In 1960, 90% of people married at 21. That's on that's average, extraordinary. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 It was, I mean, it was a very family focused um uh society. 
And and I like to remind people that, uh, you know, we talk about a rise of single living, but in really it's a re-rise in single living, right? There was a time in hu human existence where no one was married because I mentioned there was no such thing as marriage. It just didn't exist. It just didn't exist. And and it was actually um, the case where like being single wasn't as um, as challenging per se. There was a little bit more, um, I'd say, openness to these different views. But we, you know, things shifted uh, worldwide in this way, and it's now starting to unravel a little bit. And against the the backdrop for lack of a better term or phrase, when we're learning that the world is overpopulated or it's underpopulated and we need to make more human beings immediately or we need to stop making human beings immediately. It's all yeah. fascinating. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I need to do that or I, I am obligated to do that. Yeah, amen, George. You know, it's funny. So in 1970, you had books like The Population Bomb, that was worried about overpopulation. And now you have folks like Elon Musk who are concerned about the existence of humanity because we're going to see a drop in um, in world population. It's hard to imagine that, but you know, in the next hundred years or so, because we don't have the same replacement rates. I, you know, my feeling about this is um is threefold. The first one is I'm not going to tell people to do something that they may not agree with themselves for this world that may or may not arrive the way it's being predicted, right? Because we're already seeing these changes. The second one is at the same time that everybody's um, concerned about a drop in depopulation, we're also facing this rise in AI and robotics that is going to start fulfilling many of the roles that people have in society. And so, um, you know, I think that in some ways, having families in the future might end up getting easier in a sense. And this this sounds crazy to say, but I believe that, that having a family will be more of a recreational activity as a result of that, right? So imagine, you know, living a life where you don't need to work 60 hours a week to survive in a sense, then the pop, the idea of having a family might become easier in that sense. And then the last one is, let's make up our minds. Which one is bad? Too many people or too few people? And so one of the things that I believe that humans are very good at is adapting to their circumstances and inventing solutions to their problems. And so um, I don't feel like that argument to get people to couple up and have kids is a very strong one. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And it's interesting. I don't know what the what the reason that my grandparents uh, had growing up on a farm to have lots of children. I, you know, mm -hmm. I suspect that there were a lot of reasons. Maybe they just loved big families or kids. Maybe they sure. needed maybe they needed extra hands to to work the farm. Maybe more kids died back then. So they wanted to have more in case a yes. couple, you know, these are all terrible things, but but part of the human condition. And you I, say I would... I would add something to that, George. You know, we have a tendency, um, you know, because really these big families got started with this agrarian age. And I think there's some some other reasons that people don't um, assume to be the case. They, they often chalk it up to we need farmhands. But some of it was these structures could accommodate a lot of kids. These were extended families, multi-generational, with both married people and non-married people as part of this corporate family or extended family. And so you had multiple adults there to help the kids. If one person, if a, if a father died or someone took off, there were other people who could step in. And so it was a, it was a much different structure than this nuclear family that we have right now that's very isolating. And moreover, we just didn't have reliable birth control back then. And you know, the last I checked, human beings like having sex. It's really fun. And so the one of the biggest game changers here, and people, the, the pro-population crowd seems to ignore this, is that even married people are having fewer kids because they can, right? Because they can still have sex and not have kids because of this wonderful invention in 1960 called the pill. Yeah, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. So 
let's make up our minds. Is this good or bad? <laughs> I mean, I I spend a lot of time. Mm-hmm. I spend a lot of time thinking and encouraging other people to make up your own mind, mm-hmm. decide what you want your life to to look like, and then start working in service of getting that thing. And I'm confident that it, that probably a lot of what you're thinking is that there's a lot of systems and assumptions and structures that we're all working under, if it's family or societal or the place that we work, where we socialize. Mm-hmm. And I think it's such a good thing for us to spend a little bit of time is what is right for me? What what do I want my life to look like? Hallelujah. I <laughs> I love that perspective in part because if you think about it, marriage was designed to solve societal problems. It can solve individual problems, perhaps, right? So you, you want close connection in your life, right? You want um, financial security, right? You know what I mean? You want good companionship and, com- and company. You want to have children and so on. And so in this way, marriage is often a very good path for a lot of people. What I want, like you, George, is I want people to choose it rather than default into it. And I think for them to really choose it, it is worthwhile considering how you may solve those problems in other ways. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, um, one thing that single people, especially lifelong single people are very good at is finding other forms of connection. They tend to have um, many more friends, diverse uh, connections. They're more involved in their community uh, than married people who tend to be rather isolated, which often puts those married people at great risk due to, you know, due to divorce, one in three, death, one in two, you know, and disability. And so um, I, I agree with you. I think that um, people who marry should choose it to be very clear that they're accepting a set of ro- rules, a set of norms, a set of stages, and um, and I invite them to relax or remove some of those rules if they don't serve them very well. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's a you know it's fascinating. Um, human beings are fascinating. The way we Indeed. interact with one another are fascinating, and certainly I'm a byproduct of uh, parents that split up, and so they split up when I was five years old. And that's a really rough thing. It's a rough mm-hmm. thing and has been now for the le- for the le- for the next 40 years. Uh, it's been tricky and has created interesting holiday dynamics and family dynamics and everything else. And mm-hmm. it's not, I, I don't blame anybody for it, but that's a reality. And in advance of our conversation today, I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, your choice to to be single is not a an irrevocable decision. I can- right. Become yes. unsingle, should I decide to do that? How much time, if any, did you spend thinking about the difference of, of from a man's perspective versus a woman's perspective? Just in that as a man, I can theoretically speaking, father children later in life, whereas women cannot necessarily. Yeah, certainly. And this actually came up in one of my solo podcast episodes. I had a sociologist who does research on the sociology of time. How you know time is this construct, this thing that we invent, and it and it has cultural significance to it, and this notion of waiting, um, right? And so singles often live in what we call a liminal world, this world that feels temporary, until I find my person, right? And and they, as I I uh, mentioned, they may feel less than until they find their person because they're treated as less than until they find their person. And this is especially challenging for women because of this so-called biological clock, right? That that, that um, most women who wanna have children want to do it with a partner. And uh, that means that some of this, you know, despite the fact that they have everything else in their life together, their career, their friendships, their health, their family, they, they need the cooperation of someone else in order to do this. And if you can't make that happen and you believe the only way that you want to have kids is with a lifelong partner, you could be stuck in this waiting game with this clock ticking 
and getting a lot of pressure. So honey, is there anyone special kind of thing? And so I find, um, so I have a solo community. Um, Two thirds of that community are women. I think women are much more sensitive to the challenges. They feel the pain a lot more. And I think that they're also better at seeking out solutions to this. Um, and so I think that your observation is uh, is a keen one, um, that the world doesn't uh, treat um, single men and single women the same. Single men get a different, so single women get this sort of pitying kind of feeling, you know, and single men, you know, they get this, uh, you know, Peter, it's time to grow up. It's time to, <laughs> it's time to do the hard work. And it's time to become an adult. It's time to stop being a Peter Pan, settle down, partner up, you know what I mean? And grow up. And I, um, you know, I, I don't have the experience that women have and my, my heart goes out to them because I don't think that they should have to navigate that, that world. Um, I also don't have a lot of tolerance for that, that view that um, single people are selfish and not growing up. As I've already mentioned, they're more involved in their communities. They donate more of their time um, than married people. They're more likely to care, give an elderly parent. Um, they can use the time and energy and money that would normally go to a family to make art, to build businesses, to contribute to science. You know, that there are many ways to contribute to the world beyond just having children, right? albeit an important way. And so I, um, I'm very eager with this project to move beyond relationship status as a way we think about people, right? So people are very interested. So George, are you seeing anyone, right? George, are you, are you married? Because they wanna know how to treat you, right? But knowing whether you're single or married tells you almost nothing about someone, right? It doesn't tell you about their lifestyle. It doesn't tell you whether they like to go to the beach or the mountains, right? It doesn't tell you if they're contributing to the arts or the sciences. And, and it doesn't tell you very much about how happy they are. And so what I'm eager to do is to not talk about being single, but rather talking about being solo. And solo has these three elements. We've already covered some of them indirectly. The first one is that a solo is wholehearted. That is, they, they see themselves as a complete person. They're not half of a whole. And that cha that fundamentally changes how you feel about yourself. And it also changes the way you approach dating, for example, like that you're willing to add someone to your life, but you, but you don't have to have this person because you're not incomplete without them. And I think that that's, that's rather remarkable feeling to have. And it's really an empowering one. The second one, it, I think it goes completely against this Peter Pan phenomenon, which is, that solos tend to be autonomous. They tend to be self-reliant. They are a good parent to themselves. And so when I think about what makes someone an adult, it's not reaching a certain age. It's not getting married and having kids. It's, can you parent yourself? Mm -hmm. Right. And then what that allows you to do is to choose partners and to interact with partners in a way that is interdependent rather than codependent. Right. Because, you know, there, so basically you can be a married man and be a child because you need your spouse to For sure. feed you, clothe you, soothe you, provide you a social relation, social relationships. And then if that person decides to leave you, which, by the way, 80 percent of marriages are ended by the wife, you're suddenly cast adrift. Um, and then the last one, the last element is uh that solos tend to be unconventional thinkers. And, and you already alluded to this earlier, George, and that is that they tend to um, not just accept what the world says they should do and accept what the world says will make them happy. They think about what makes them happy and then they choose rather than default. And so they, they, have, they tend to have unconventional rules about relationships, but then also about life more generally. I think that those are are very compelling and and powerful. Um, one of my favorite poems is Shel Silverstein's "The Missing Piece." 
Are you okay. familiar with that one? I'm not. No, I know you the giving it. tree. That's yeah. the one I grew I, up on. Yeah. I literally, I cannot read the giving tree without breaking into tears. Oh uh, yeah. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but it's, it's essentially what you've just described. It's, hmm. it's this missing piece. It's a, it looks like a wheel and he's got a little pizza slice missing and he's uh. rolling around looking for something outside of him to fill the missing piece when mm -hmm. all along we it's all know yes. it's it's an inside job <laughs> right. and becoming self-reliant mm -hmm. and then being available to enter into an independent relationship with another like-minded person who shares similar values to yours and you're not just coming together because you're trying to complete one another you're yes. already complete and now you can move forward um however you choose so i think that makes a lot of sense and, and moreover it also allows you to expand what is a valuable relationship in your life right so for example when you think about a traditional marriage or what we call the relationship escalator, it has these very strict rules. You need to live with a partner. You need to merge your finances, merge your identity. I call it the benefication of a relationship. <laughs> merge your values, right? You have, you have the vacation together. You have to do everything together. It's It becomes the most high status relationship you have, crowding out all the others, Yeah. right? So it's more important than your friendship of 35 years, suddenly overnight. And it's a sexually and romantically exclusive relationship, right? But what if, for example, the most important person in your life is a platonic partner, is that friend of 35 years, mm -hmm. and you share a residence with that person, right? They are the most high status person for you, but you don't have sex with them and you don't vacation with them, you know, like and that thing. Is that relationship any less worthy of tax breaks, of benefits at work, of a thousand federal laws and benefits that, that married people get? I don't think so. And so um, I think that, that expanding what it means to have close connections in our life will actually do people a favor in order for them to find the best people for them at, the, at their particular stage in life. Do you think that everybody is... I, I don't know if there's a right term for this, evolved enough to pull this kind of a thing off? No, uh, no, of course not. But um, I believe in people in this sense. And, and the issue is this is they managed to pull marriages off for the most part, sure. as messy as that is. Um, and doing a marriage is difficult. Like if you just heard all the things that I just talked about, you're like, yeah, wow, that's a pretty tall order, you know, to have. And so um, what these unconventional relationships demand, and what I would argue even a traditional relationship demands is authenticity, honesty, communication. And so to the degree that you're breaking the rules, um, you often have to find a new script, but you can't find it. You have to create it yourself. And so what I, I have a chapter in, in the book called relationship design, where the people in the relationship, romantic or otherwise, come together and discuss the agreement. What are our expectations? What are the rules, big and small? And then regularly evaluate and revise as needed. And so in my dating life, I regularly will say to someone I'm dating, so how do you think this is going? You know, are you happy? Is there any changes that you want to make? Well, that's the same conversation married people should be having in the sense. And so we're going to need people to evolve in order to allow them sort of more degrees of freedom in this sense. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Hmm. Excellent point. I, I believe can see in your people wheels too. are turning, George. Uh, yeah, man. I, I think... <laughs> I mean, for me, I got married when I was 38. Okay. And had I been married any earlier than that, right. I would have been, I would have gotten divorced for sure. I just, mm -hmm. I had so many things to experience on my own and to think about and to do on my own. And if I had not done those, I would not be available to have a successful relationship with, with my wife. Um, and your statistics are 
they're not yours, that 80% of marriages or whatever are not successful or not happy is evidence that that people are not doing this work, even though to your point, we're all capable of living an examined life and to think yeah. about these things. It takes a lot of vulnerability, right? So, cause imagine, cause you're, you're promised that getting married equals bliss. And unfortunately the data don't support that. Yeah, you know, for, that's not true. You know, it's not true. It's just a different path in life, you know, and um, and it's what you make it. And so you're promised that this is supposed to be great. And then it often isn't because, you know, you have two people who have different, right, different ways of living. People change and so on. But to ask someone, how do you think this is going is really a vulnerable thing to do because you might get a, I don't think it's going very well response. But but if it's not going well, that's the response you want, because then you can say, well, how can we get it going well again in this in this way? And then you have to be willing to go against the grain of society and, for example, make some changes. I like to say that a non-trivial number of divorces could have been avoided if the people talked earlier and they were willing to relax some of the rules. Like, Maybe we should have separate bedrooms. Maybe we should have separate residences, right? Maybe we should alter um, the the way that we approach this relationship. Yeah, our neighbors are going to think we're weird. Yeah, our parents aren't going to understand it. But what's more important, the the sanctity of this relationship and the connection or making other people happy? And I think the answer is clear. Yeah, well said. Peter, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people learn more about you? How can they engage? And where can they get their copy of Solo, Building a Remarkable Life on Your Own? Uh, well, obviously, Amazon's selling it. Um, you can find more about me at petermcgraw.org slash solo. Um, the podcast is there. I host events called The Solo Salon. And um, uh, people can learn also, I think the, the single listeners can learn what type of of single they are. There's four different types of singles. And so um, not only can uh, people figure out what are some alternatives to uh, the types of relationships that they're having, but they can also figure out, oh, how should I be thinking about my my single life? Love it. Well, if you enjoyed this as much as I did, show Peter your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. Pick up your copy of Solo on Amazon. Go to petermcgraw.org check out the podcast check out the solo salon and then figure out what type of single you are as well we all love taking assessments thanks Kim Peter cheers till next time remember do your part by doing your best <laughs>